Welcome to the Radio Bible Class uh, for April the 11th, and uh, this is a redo. Uh, this morning as I was videoing the uh, Radio Bible Class, when I got finished, I realized I had done it on time lapse. And so we had a 30-minute radio show in a 30-second video. Wouldn't work, uh, so we're redoing the, the lesson portion of it. So if you're watching on YouTube, just know that I did want you to get the lesson today because uh, they do build on each other from uh, the book of Romans. And today we return to our study in the book of Romans. Uh, this morning we come to the fourth of those mercies of God we talked about before that Paul says should lead to us uh, to present our bodies as a living sacrifice uh, to God. Now in the past weeks we've looked at a number of things. Last week we took a break and, and looked at uh, at Easter, at the resurrection, uh, but in the weeks before that, we looked at the powerful gospel of Christ that God uses uh, to uh, make us right with himself. Uh, we then looked at the wrath of God and the goodness of God and how those are set uh, with each other and how that uh, the goodness of God allows us to escape uh, the wrath of God. Then we looked at the righteousness of God that allows us to be justified when it's received by faith. And today we come to the fourth, which I have called assurance, uh, and that's brought on by being justified by faith. Uh, when we're justified by faith, there's some assurance of our salvation that comes with that. Now, Webster defines uh, assurance this way. Uh, it says that it's a being certain in the mind. Another is confidence of mind or manner, easy freedom from self-doubt or uncertainty. Now, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who is a commentator of some note in his commentary on Romans, says that chapter 5 uh, is a turning point, one of the turning points in the book. And with chapter 5, it begins a new section uh, in the book, in the letter to the church at Rome, uh, and it encompasses what we know to be chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8. Uh, and these four chapters address the issue of assurance of, be, of a, the believer's standing with God. Uh, it, is, it addresses how we might be assured or have some assurance of our salvation. Now, if it's true that this is dedicated to that, then why are many believers living in doubt or wondering about their standing with God? It was Billy Graham who said that about 95% of Christians live in defeat because they are not sure of their salvation, their right standing with God. Now, Dr. Lloyd-Jones says that that's because they do not or have never understood the meaning of being justified by faith. In chapter 5, we want to look at the first 11 verses, which speaks directly to this. And when we're finished with that, then I will give you a little bit about how Dr. Lloyd-Jones breaks that down uh, and what it says. Then we'll look at the text in a little more deeper way. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 5 of Romans, and you might want to open your copy of God's Word and follow, says this, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into his grace, in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For while we were enemies, for if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God uh, in the death of his son, much more now 
that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Pray with me, would you? Our Father, I give you thanks for the opportunity we have uh, to spend this time in your word. I pray you would open it to us, that you'd open our spiritual eyes and ears to see and to hear what you have for us, our heart to understand it, and then give us courage to obey you. Oh, God, speak to us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Dr. Lloyd-Jones divides these verses this way. He says in verses 1 and 2, he says, If we really see and believe this doctrine of justification by faith, and if we rest our faith on Christ, then our ultimate complete salvation is certain. It's guaranteed. It's absolute. Verses 3 to 5 he goes on to say, here Paul says that nothing can shake us out of this. If we are truly in this position justified with God, no trial or trouble can make any difference. We are secure. And then in verses 6 to 11, he says that these show our salvation is unshakably certain because it is based solely in God's love, God's character, and God's actions. While we were weak and powerless enemies of God, he sent his son to die for us. Now remember that being justified is God's act making you right with him. It's received by faith and given by grace to all who believe. It's not something you can earn or that you can merit. It's based on God's work through Christ in us and for us. It's a declaration at a point in time for all time. In fact, we are declared righteous. Uh, you don't grow in, our, and, and we are declared justified. You don't grow into justification. You are either justified or you're not. One or the other. Either you are or you're not. There's another theological word, though. Uh, that word is sanctification, which means the process of being made holy, uh, resulting in a changed life for the believer. We grow in sanctification but we are declared justified. This justification results in some things that give us confidence in our mind that we are secure in our relationship with God. That assurance is God's mercy for us and to us. So how are we assured? Well, the assurance of our relationship with God comes as a result of being declared by God as justified. Let's take a quick look at some of the results of what that means. When I am justified, first it says that we have peace with God. It's not just peace as we know it, the absence of conflict or uh, tranquility of mind, like laying by, down by a river on a warm winter day or summer day. Uh, it is also not the peace of God uh, that guards the lives of believers. This is peace with God. It is the hostilities that exist between us and God because of our sin are simply taken away. They're gone. The broken relationship with God has been restored, and my mind is at rest because I am his, and I am secure. My relationship with God is sure. In fact, the Scripture says that he takes my sin, removes it as far as the east is from the west. I can be sure of that. A person at peace with God knows that God loves them in spite of their sin. A person at peace with God can answer the accusations of their own conscience. The doubts that the enemy will invariably throw at the believer, you can handle. If you don't understand the truth of having been justified, then you'll have trouble handling those accusations. But there is assurance that comes when I know that I'm justified by God and I'm secure in that. And when I am, I'm not afraid of those accusations. I'm not afraid of what the devil says or what my conscience says. But also, when I've been justified, it says we have access by faith to God's grace. Now, the idea of having gained access indicates that at one point we did not have access. It conveys the idea of being introduced to God's grace. Not everyone has access to it. Now, everyone 
everyone. You know, God loves everyone. There's no doubt about that. He's created all, no doubt about that. But not everyone is his child. Not everyone has access to his grace. Let me explain what I mean. Because, see, his grace has to be granted to us. And it comes by being justified. Let me explain what I mean. In 1972, uh, 73, excuse me, I spent two weeks in uh, New Orleans at the brand new Marriott Hotel in the French Quarter. It was a luxury hotel. It was really nice. I was there with Campus Crusade. We were doing a two-week conference for students, uh, each a week each, and so we had two groups of students coming in. Uh, and we'd heard a lot about New Orleans and a lot about the French Quarter and and all of that, and Bourbon Street, and all of those kind of things that you hear all kinds of uh, not necessarily good things about. We'd heard about them. But one of the things we'd heard most about uh, was breakfast at Brennan's. Uh, the eggs who saw it at Brennan's were just something that everyone says you need to experience when you're in New Orleans. And so on that Saturday morning, uh, some of the other staff members and I uh, got up and decided we were going to Brennan's for breakfast. Uh, we were going to have the eggs who saw it and just really enjoy that experience. So we got up, and, and as we were young people, uh, we got up. It was in August, so we were in our shorts and, and polo shirts, and uh, the, the girls were dressed, uh, you know, however they dressed, either in their shorts or, or maybe they had on slacks or might have even been wearing a dress. But when we got to, uh, when we got to Brennan's, we walked in and uh, went to the desk, asked to be seated, and uh, the maitre d' there uh, simply told us that we were did not be allowed in the way we were. Well, we were a little taken back by, by that and, and asked, well, why? And he says, well, uh, the gentlemen all have to wear sport coats or dress coats. Well, there we were in shorts and, and polo shirts. And what do we do? And, and, and we were really crestfallen. And uh, But then he smiled and he said, but it, gentlemen, if you will come with me. And he took us to a rack of sport coats that they had there just for people like us. So we each got one that fit, put it on, uh, and then we were seated. And we had our breakfast at Brennan's, and I can tell everybody I had breakfast at Brennan's. But you see, we were not allowed into the restaurant until we met their criteria, until we met their conditions. Well, the same thing's true with God's grace. Access to God's grace and his blessings that it brings to our lives comes only after we meet God's demands, and those only come to us by faith in Christ. No other way. No other way. Only by faith in Christ. Now, the fact that we experience God's grace in our lives is evidence of our relationship with him and gives us assurance, and that assurance is sure. Think about that. The fact that I experience God's grace. Now, there's a general grace. We know that, that everyone senses. But when we experience God's grace directed at us, there is something special about it, and it gives us assurance that our relationship with him is sure. But also, it says that we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. One of the blessings that comes from being justified by faith is that we rejoice in the hope of the glory. Now, the word rejoice there is rather a tame word for the one that's used. Uh, we say rejoice. The word used is more like a jubilant celebration like you would see uh, after uh, a, a low-ranking team beats the number one team in the country and, and students either rush the, uh, the floor or they rush the field and, and the exuberance that comes out. That's what it's talking about. Because I'm justified. I simply cannot help but rejoice in what God is doing and will do in my life. This glory is the end to which he created us. That's how we are to live. In that glory, experiencing that glory and giving that glory to God. The meaning of the word hope, to glory in the hope, well, that hope should not be confused with the way we use the word hope. Uh, it does not mean uh, that, well, I hope it doesn't rain, or I hope I get an A in a class. Uh, it's not at all that. The word hope means to look forward with certain unshakable confidence to the glory of God. It is a sure thing. 
This is seeing God as he is and being caught up in the wonder of all of it. But then it also says that a benefit, a blessing of being justified is that I view, it gives me a new view of trials. We also rejoice in our sufferings, our trials, and our tribulations. Uh, now that word means pressures. We rejoice because God uses these things, these trials, to strengthen us. I believe it was Charles Spurgeon who said, uh, the Lord gets his best soldiers out of the highlands of affliction. He allows us to go through the test of suffering and a trial so that we may be fashioned into instruments of strength. And look at the progression in that verse, in verses 3 and 4. Suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. And character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because God's Spirit makes us aware of God's love in all of this. Paul calls attention to the fact uh, that all of these come from, now listen to this, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's his full and complete title. It speaks of his life, death, and resurrection. It is by faith in these that we are justified and on which our assurance is grounded. Not in what we do, but it's grounded in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul closes this section of the letter with a word of encouragement to give us assurance. He says, that, look, when you were powerless, Christ died for you. Uh, again, you can't do it on your own. Uh, you're powerless, but Christ died for you. It's a demonstration of his great love for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Even as enemies of God, he reconciled us to himself through the death of his son. Though Jesus may have received, through Jesus, through Jesus we have received reconciliation. We have been made right with God. That's what that means. That is where our assurance comes from. When I believe that I am justified by faith in Jesus, then these things simply fuel my sense of assurance in my relationship with God. I, if I'm not experiencing these things, if I'm not experiencing the peace of God, if I'm not experiencing those other things we talked about, well, then I'm not experiencing, uh, then maybe my understanding of God and what he's done and what he declares about me to be true is faulty. And I need to go back and begin to believe the truth. Well, what are you to do? What you should, should you do with all of this? Well, if you are confident, if you're assured in your standing with God, well, then you don't need to do anything. Just, I rejoice with you. Keep on. Keep on growing as a disciple. Keep on doing what he wants you to do. Keep on making a difference. And do so completely assured of his work in your life. But what if you're not so confident? Well, if you're not, then let me share with you what to do. Some of you are living in defeat. Some of you are wondering, what can I do? What should I do? And let me tell you, here is what you do. Today, drive a stake in the ground. Now, this is what I mean. Drive an anchoring point. So you can always go back and say, at this moment, I know what I did. Let me tell you my own experience. I became a Christian as an eight-year-old. I was baptized, was in the church, and I believe from that moment, I have been a Christian. I got to college my first semester, I began to know everything about everything, just like many college students, and I got a little bit away from my faith. Uh, as a sophomore in college, I began to understand that God loved me unconditionally. It was at a retreat I went to, and, and I know, I believe I was a Christian. Uh, and from the time of eight to being a 19-year-old. But I will tell you that in, on December the 27th of 1967, at Rock Eagle 4-H camp in Eatonton, Georgia, I drove a stake and made sure that I was saved, that I was Christ. Now, when the devil attacks me uh, now and brings up all kinds of stuff, I can go back to that point and I can say, no, no, you can have what you want, 
you can you can before that it's debatable maybe but from that point on from december 27 1967 i know i gave my life to christ well today you can do the same on april 11 2021 you can drive your stake and it won't matter what's behind it because the scripture says God has already removed that as far as east is from the west. But from this point forward, when the devil comes, when the accusations come, you go right back to this point. Here's what John had to say in the New Testament back in 1 John. He says, And the witness is this, that God has given us eternal life, and his life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. Did you catch that? You can know, not wonder about, not hope for, uh, not in and out, but you can know that you have eternal life. And that life transforms you. Transformation comes as we experience all of these blessings of being justified. Assurance brings steadfast strength to the life of a believer. Today, what I want most for you is for you to be assured. Assured. And here's what happens. When I am sure of my relationship with God, then I'm not always looking over my shoulder, wondering, oh, is God going to zap me for that? Am I in or am I out? No, because that means that my focus is only on me. It allows me to focus on the people around me, to share the good news, of forgiveness that's found in Christ, that others can be justified. Folks, assurance of salvation is something really real, something we really need. And I pray you'll experience it today. Drive your stake. Pray with me. Father, I give you thanks. And I pray for each person who hears this, that they would drive that stake today. They would make certain. And from this point forward, they never need to wonder again because they can know that they are justified, that you've declared them that, and that their walk with you is secure. Now let us live that way and have our lives transformed and make a difference in the lives of others, we pray. Amen.